We hope you enjoy this episode of the Modern Divorce Podcast. But first, an important message for our listeners. Embarking on a new chapter? Zach Nutzman of the Darwin Wall team at Realty One Group is your go-to real estate expert in Arizona, specializing in guiding couples and families through their real estate needs while experiencing a divorce. Modern Law's trusted partner, Zach, brings expertise, confidence, and compassion to your real estate journey. Let him help you navigate this challenging time. Zach Nutzman, your modern solution in real estate. Today, I am going to be joined by a local criminal defense attorney, Mark Mendoza. We're going to talk about all of the questions related to felony murder, kidnapping charges, um, the different sentences that might be available for the people who have been arrested for the murder of Preston Lord. Mark, how are you? I'm great. Can you hear me okay? <laughs> Thank you for being here. You finished law school in 2005. That's right when I did. So we've been doing this a long time. Yes. And I see that you were a prosecutor for Maricopa County and Pinal County. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So how long have you been? About 12 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how long have you been in private practice? Uh, I've been in private practice since 2017. Uh, so four years. Nice. Anyway, seven years. I don't know why I said four years. 2024. Yeah, seven years. Well, thank <laughs> you so much for making the time. Where do you live in the Valley? So currently I live in the West Valley previously, and I raised my family in the East Valley, actually, in Gilbert. Of all awesome. Things. Yeah, it was something have, you're familiar. Awesome. And have you been following the Gilbert Goons um, saga at all? So not not to fanboy too much, but yes, via you a lot. Oh, good. On TikTok. <laughs> on TikTok. <laughs> we love TikTok, don't we? We love TikTok. Yeah. For putting in front of us what we want to hear about. Yes. Well, and so, as you know, then yesterday was kind of a major break in the case, and there have now been six arrests, right. and the charges are pretty severe. And we, the public, have lots and lots of questions about right. what all of this means. Right. It is so, an interesting day today. Yeah. When I woke up this morning and saw the news, I was like, oh, wow, finally, something, finally, finally, right? Okay, so it's really interesting to hear you, a professional, say, finally, right. that we, the public, have felt a little gaslit <laughs> right. at, at the Maricopa County attorney telling us that we have been impatient, but you also think finally. So tell me a little bit about that. So, yeah, it's just, it's interesting, again, that it's taken, it's, you know, what is it, March 7th now? And so it's just been this long. Again, as you mentioned before, I was a prosecutor for 12 years in a couple of different jurisdictions, eight years at Maricopa County. So I've seen it from that side. I know how quickly they they can investigate cases, how quickly they can f do evidence and do things. And uh, it's just shocking it's taken this long to get to the point of, you know, an actual indictment and charges. That's especially on a very serious, serious case with a lot of publicity behind it. Yeah. And it does seem like they've put a lot of resources on it and they've taken it seriously and they know how much the public is taking it seriously. And sure. it did feel like it took a long time. But here we are. And now, so far, six people have been charged and they've all been charged with felony murder. Yes. And kidnapping. Yes. Is the felony the kidnapping? So it, to be fair and as disclosure, I haven't actually looked at the indictment yet. I haven't seen the actual indictment, but uh, felony murder in, is a law in Arizona that if someone's committing any, there's some specific set of felonies that are allowed for that. Kidnapping is one of them. If in the course of or in the furtherance of doing said felony, kidnapping, presumably in this case, uh, somebody dies one could be charged with felony murder, which is a first-degree murder charge, which is the highest, most serious charge you can get. So 
uh, presumably that that may be the charge that's the underlying felony for felony murder again i'm not 100 percent sure because i haven't seen the actual indictment but yeah okay so s- someone else was charged with aggravated robbery i believe there are also aggravated robbery charges could that could it be any felony that leads to felony murder it, it's not so it can't just be any type of felony there's you know, lots and lots and lots of crimes that are on the books and it's not just any felony. It's, it's very, very specific and it has to be some of the more serious types of felonies that we're talking about. Uh, the idea behind that felony murder law is if you're out committing one of these very serious crimes, be aware because if something happens, somebody dies, you're, you're getting charged with something serious. So it it can't be a, a less serious type of felony, you know, as a simple, let's say drug possession or something like that. Um, that's not one of those crimes, but something like kidnapping is, you know, uh, an armed robbery, those types of offenses that are a little bit more serious are on the list of, of crimes that are allowed for sure. So the first person here that they've got listed is William Owen Hine, and his charges are one count of first degree murder and in the alternative second degree, both class one felonies, and then one count of kidnapping, a class two felony. So can you explain that? If yeah. if if the felony murder is for the kidnapping, then would that be two separate counts? Yeah, it, it's a uh, you know prosecutors can choose how they decide or elect to charge someone with any particular offense that may have occurred. In this case, it appears the Maricopa County Attorney's Office have have charged a count in the alternative, which is uh, rare. It's it's legal, but it's rare, and so. Essentially, what they'd be presenting to the jury at trial is, we believe this murder happened by two different ways. One way is it's second-degree murder, and the other way we believe it happened is there was this felony being committed, and in the course of that felony, this individual, individual Preston Lord Bean, uh, passed away, and and this person's responsible for it. So that someone can commit murder by multiple different ways under multiple different theories under the law is what it is. And so, and then separate apart from that is just a kidnapping. So an individual can be convicted of both the felony murder and also the separate underlying felony. And those are separate charges, separate convictions that carry with them separate sentences. Wow. Yeah. And is it true that if someone is convicted of first degree murder, the minimum sentence is life in prison? That is true. That is what the law is on the in Arizona. It's a life imprisonment. And yeah, that's what it is. So there's also the possibility if the prosecutor elected, and again, we don't know that yet, uh, they could pursue the ultimate penalty, which is allowed under this uh, in Arizona, which is the death penalty. That decision, I don't know if that's been made yet by uh, Rachel Mitchell or not in her office. They have a, a time period after which they charge someone to make that determination if they're seeking that type of penalty or not. In my experience, usually under first degree felony murder, they usually do not seek that type of penalty. And that's usually reserved for a, a, a more of a premeditated type of murder situation. But it is a possible penalty. But nevertheless, the minimum is life imprisonment, yes. And, and if they were convicted of more than one crime, it would just get tacked on, like life in prison plus? Yes, yes. As, as crazy that, as that sounds, you know, individuals can get a life sentence for felony murder and then get have other charges as well and, and get convicted for those and get life imprisonment. And then also on top of that, another... 10 and a half years, another 21 years, and the judge could choose also to run that second count concurrent, meaning at the same time as a life sentence, or consecutive, which is, uh, I guess, an academic discussion, but uh, I don't know how you get consecutive to serving a life sentence, but that means one sentence after the other. But yeah, those can be stacked on top of each other. Many people are very, very confused about the kidnapping charges. Because the allegation is that, you know, he was beaten and murdered in a fight. Yeah. How do we get to kidnapping? That is a great question. Love that question. Um, so as a prosecutor years ago, 
in in Phoenix, there was a lot of news. This is uh, 2008 and nine around that time, 2010. A lot of uh, news about kidnappings going on and, and kidnapping. And most of us think of someone's grabbing a, a kid or grabbing a person and throwing them in the trunk of a car and driving off. It, it's really not that complicated. It's actually much more simple than that. Kidnapping is uh, someone knowingly restrains another person. And the word restrains doesn't necessarily mean, you know, you're tying them up, duct taping them or anything else. Restrain under the law in Arizona simply means restricting someone's movement. So get in the corner, don't move, and I and I hold a gun at you and tell you not to move, I'm restraining you. Um, so kidnapping is restraining somebody with the intent to do something else. That's what makes it kidnapping. A, a restraint is an unlawful imprisonment. A restraint with some other further intention is a kidnapping. And under the law in Arizona, there's several different ways you can commit a kidnapping. So restraining with the intent to hold someone for ransom, um, hold them as a hostage or something like that. Um, another way you could do that is you're holding them with the intent to inflict death, physical injury, um, a sexual offense, or somehow aid in the commission of some other crime that's going on. Again, I haven't seeing the indictment, but that potentially could be one of the theories here is that they're restraining with the intent to inflict physical injury. So uh, again, I don't know all the facts and circumstances, but if you are restraining someone's movement with the intention of hurting them or causing them harm or killing them, that could be it. One of the other ways you could do it is if you're restraining them with the intent to place the victim in reasonable apprehension of imminent physical injury. So if you're restraining them with the intention of causing them future harm or something like that. So you can see these theories under the law, you can get a little bit loose with it and how you can charge someone with kidnapping when they're not tying someone up or moving them from one spot to another spot or driving them from this state to that state. It doesn't require any of that. It's actually very, very broad and can come up in a lot of different scenarios. So does that mean if somebody was holding him his arms or his body while someone else was hitting him. Could that be the kidnapping? Absolutely it could be, right? So someone is holding someone's arms down or pinning them down on the ground while someone else is, is assaulting that individual. If they are restraining them with the intent to assault them, with the intent to cause them physical injury, with the intent to do something else, that's where you get that kidnapping. That absolutely could be the scenario. Well, you mentioned the death penalty. Some of these are minors. If I understand correctly, they can't be given the death penalty. Is that right? That is right. Under the under the law in the, in the United States, uh, yeah, juveniles or, or minors, people under the age of 18 cannot receive the death penalty. But anybody over 18 could. They could, yeah. If the jury makes the proper findings of that, they, they could sentence somebody to death, yes. One of the individuals who was arrested today, the accusation is that he filmed the attack okay, and then left the scene and colluded to come up with a story and or destroy evidence. Okay. And he is also being charged with felony murder and kidnapping. Interesting. Okay. Can you explain this? So how does this like group charging work if let's say one person held him doing the kidnapping one person hit him doing the assault like how does the group charging work that is a that is a great question um so this comes up in arizona it's called accomplice liability like you said maybe one person is actually doing the hitting one's holding down one's filming maybe one's driving them away from where the crime happened right but these are what we call accomplices and under arizona law an accomplice is responsible for the conduct and the foreseeable conduct and what they intend to assist in. So, you know, your classic example is the bank robbery, right? The one that goes in to rob the bank and then the getaway driver didn't actually have the gun or didn't rob the bank, but they were part of that. They get charged with the exact same crime because they're assisting in, in committing that crime. They assist in committing it, getting someone there, getting them the tools to commit the crime assisting on scene or assisting them in getting away from the crime or 
or helping in after the fact. So a compass liability comes in, in many ways, but it applies the same. It's not a lesser charge. It's not a lesser degree. It's the same charge, but as an accomplice, you assisted somebody or were an accomplice to somebody. So yeah. Is this normal? Like how often does this really happen? Because it it feels weird a little bit to to charge someone with first degree murder who took the video he it feels that there should be maybe less culpability culpability but maybe less so yeah like how often does this happen yeah that that is a it's a unique circumstances again i don't have as i speak I, i qualify everything i'm saying because i again i don't have all the police reports i haven't seen all the evidence but based on what we know publicly at this point it, it does seem a little bit odd that a person who is filming, um, not participating in some way, and maybe afterwards is is helping with the cover-up story, that does seem a little bit odd to, to charge them with the same level as maybe the person that is holding them down and the person that's doing the actual beating that, that results in, in Preston's death, the actual murder. That is odd. It is an odd circumstance to have that. Now, again, I don't know all the circumstances. I don't know if this is all part of the same plan. So when I mentioned before about accomplice liability, it's very broad. The statutes are very broad, and the prosecutor can choose when to invoke that or not. So solicitation, or excuse me, accomplice liability is someone that solicits or commands another person to commit an offense. So I don't know if the individual, for example, that's filming said, hey, you guys go do this and I'll film it. They're soliciting or commanding another person to do it. That's an accomplice. And so, again, you get that same level of offense. Did they aid, they counsel, agree to aid, or attempt to aid another person in planning or committing it, provide a means or opportunity for them? So it's very broad. So, again, without knowing a little bit more information, whether or not that's an appropriate charge or not, I, I don't know. But it is odd if it's just someone who happens to be there, happens to film it, knows the suspects or the the defendants in this case who are involved and even talks to them after that's not enough in and of itself there has to be these elements of assistance or commanding or aiding you know those types of things are are what's required if that makes sense under the law got it so that's what where we would see a defense attorney come in and plead not guilty and say we don't think that our client did this did, right actually um participated in or furthered and the murder exactly that that's exactly it you know the type of defense you have under the laws we call you know presence i was merely present when the crime happened but i didn't participate in any way shape or form because i was there filming a fight doesn't ergo make me guilty of what happens in that fight or the consequences of that fight you know i just, i understand it's a teenagers a bunch of them but you know at a party I have teenage children myself, so, you know, uh, not that it's a proud moment, but, you know, kids film everything these days all the time. And and so simply filming because a, a fight, I call it a fight, it ultimately it ends up in a murder, ends up being a murder, happens, um, that in and of itself isn't a crime. There there must be something else there to, to latch on to. We're going to hold you to the same level of culpability as the person actually killing Preston. In the civil lawsuit that has been filed, one of the allegations is that there is a civil conspiracy to commit these assaults. Part of that civil conspiracy includes videoing it and then posting it and humiliating the victim. Yes. So is that, if that's a pattern, if that's part of the conspiracy, where does, how does the civil conspiracy theory translate to the criminal context that's a great question i i again i i see what i see kind of in the news as i read little snippets and different things of, of what i've seen all over the recent interview of and i can't remember her name the the woman uh who uh, Ashley reynolds yes mm-hmm. who recently came forward and and said you know i quickly became involved unknowingly and whatever else mm-hmm. you know just listening to different things it, it, it appears that these groups of kids were doing this and i think i read somewhere or heard somewhere this was somehow some kind of initiation or or something else that you know that they were going to film and they were going to beat on someone and film it and then you know as kids would do post it everywhere because there's no point in filming it unless you're going to share it with other people otherwise what's the point of filming something right so 
that they do that. And because of that, it's what brings, quote, in their minds, these kids' minds, value to the beating is the the praise that's gained from it, the, quote, respect that's gained by the, the gang or the group of individuals from, from what occurred. And so it all becomes wrapped up in that, that the filming does become part of um, you know, the beating because one without the other, you know, both parts are needed in order to have this whole thing kind of come together in this perfect tragic storm for Preston. One of the things they're looking at is whether or not they can classify the Gilbert Goons as a street gang. Right, right. And if they are, then apparently there will be increased sentencing, mm-hmm. which again, doesn't seem to be all that relevant when you're looking at life in prison. But um, if they can prove, yes, this is a gang, and part of their gang activity was going around beating people up and filming it, does that increase the culpability of the filmer? It it, it does. And and sorry, one of the parts you said is like, why, why charge gang mm-hmm. charges or something if you have the ultimate charge of murder? Again, hearkening back to experience, prosecutors may charge certain things because it allows them to get into other evidence that they wouldn't be able to get into otherwise, right? If they've only charged a murder that happened on that day, and they can talk about evidence and things that occurred that day, that evening, and what what happened. But if the prosecutor wants to get into the bigger picture of, look, this person filming is actually part of this bigger thing going on as part of this gang, well, then they have to charge a gang charge so that they're allowed to talk about the bigger picture of how this fits into something much, much larger. So that's why you would add a charge like that. It allows the prosecutor to get into evidence and and paint a, a bigger, broader picture for the jury of, what totally is going on and and how this filmer video this person taking video is part of this gang if that's what they're alleging and and why that's just an important element as the actual beating and why that person should be held to the same level of culpability and how that person becomes an accomplice because i read to you about soliciting aiding counseling the other individual you know that's a the accomplice statute is very very broad um and so in order for the prosecutor to, to get to something like that, they'd probably have to allege this type of gang thing and they'd have to get into this bigger picture thing. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Just on its face, it's odd. And at the end of the day, when you're talking about to a jury and presenting a case and evidence, most jurors have pretty good common sense. Like, does this make sense to me or does it not make sense to me, right? And so uh, the prosecutor needs to to be able to get into a lot more evidence than just what happened that night. Okay, so a couple of questions from that. Right now, there are no charges for gang charges. Will the charges change? Could the charges be changed? Or are the prosecutors stuck with the charges that they initially make? Great question. Um, they can change. The, the charges can change at any time. Uh, uh, so the charges that we have now is because the prosecutor presented via the investigator, their investigation to a grand jury who listened, who decided by probable cause, there's probably a crime that happened, and these are probably the individuals that did it. If at some point the prosecutor finds more evidence or wants to seek more charges, they can go back to the grand jury and present that again and get additional charges or a new indictment. They can add charges to that, but via that same process, they would do that. And so it can change. It happens often. I have many clients whose charges change during the course of the representation, depending on the evidence. Charges can be added. Charges can be taken away. It's all part of the process of going through the court system. One of the questions that many people have asked is, had they, any of these boys or young men, come forward earlier, would they be facing lesser charges? Interesting. I I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, it's a hypothetical that we don't Mm -hmm. really know. Um, When you're, I guess, your listeners or you're asking if they had came forward, is that under the scenario of like, if they had cooperated with police sooner, is that what that is suggesting maybe? They're wondering, yeah, what people are asking is if somebody had come and turned themselves in and said, hey, I want to cooperate, I was part of this, could they then have negotiated a manslaughter plea and been looking at many fewer le- years? That's the question. Yeah, no, that that's what I thought you were asking. I was just making sure. Usually what we end up seeing is if, if someone were to come forward early on and cooperate and, and with police and provide names or information or evidence that would lead to other arrest and other individuals. And that individual would likely be asked to testify in a future trial against those other people. Um, those individuals usually get charged with, honestly, the same thing. The charges end up being the same at the beginning, but those individuals end up 
working out usually some type of deal with a lesser charge, they end up with lesser punishments or a lesser charge at the end via negotiating. I did a plea agreement instead of first degree murder, I pled to manslaughter and now I'm only facing, you know, seven to 21 years in prison instead of the rest of my life. Right. And so oftentimes prosecutors will do those types of deals or law enforcement will work with people to get information. They provide that information and they're truthful in that information. Prosecutors often will then at the time of sentencing, this is years down the road, right? Say this person was helpful, instrumental in our case, be leaning on them judge. And then they're given a, a lesser sentence in some regard. It doesn't mean they get off, they get out. But in the beginning, they're usually charged with the same thing. It's during the plea negotiation process as the case is going to be going on for the next several years that gets kind of worked out, if that makes sense. It does. It makes it makes a lot of sense. So just because they were charged with first degree or in the alternative second degree doesn't mean that that's what we will end up seeing. And also, I, if I understand correctly, what one person ends up being convicted of or ple pleads to might not be what somebody else pleads to. That is absolutely right. I mean, there's when you're talking about first degree murder and that's what's charged, the, the, the possibilities are endless of, of where that goes, right? Because you're charged with the most serious thing. It can go anywhere else from there and different people can result in different things. Someone may plead to second degree. Someone may plead to just a kidnapping. And, and I don't know, all those factors come out kind of as time goes on as these individuals hire attorneys and they work those cases. That's where those things come up where the results end up being different depending on, again, what's the evidence against them? How strong is the case against them? Did they cooperate? What's their background? Do they have a prior history? All those factors come into a prosecutor's decision to how do we resolve these cases at some point, right? If it does go to trial, will there be one trial with multiple defendants or separate trials for each defendant? Great question. Could be both, right? It uh, could be a trial with multiple co-defendants at the same time, so one trial for all of them. It could be each of them gets their own separate trial. Usually, a prosecutor will want to do one trial with all the co-defendants. Prosecutor wants to try the case once, call their witnesses once, and and have the evidence presented against all of them at, at once. That's the preference rather than having to do the trial four different times. Just do it one time, right? For defendants, and there's a, a strategy question there, right? Is it strategic for me to go to trial with all these other people here with me, or should I try to sever my case and, and get a separate trial from everyone else? And those are decisions that are made in the course of the case. How much evidence is there against my client? Is my client just the client that was filming the fight? Well, I want to sever that guy out from everyone else. He wasn't beating. He wasn't this. He wasn't that. Judge, the only evidence against, alleged evidence against my client is X, Y, and Z. It's very different. It's not even on the same level. So I should get a different trial, right? So then they'll be fighting about getting their own trial. Because ultimately, I think each one would want their own trial, presumably, if they can, right? So it's it's just up to the judge. It is. It's up to the lawyers, right? Strategy questions and decisions of do they want to go to trial with everyone or, or or do they want to have their own? You might find some lawyers that say there's not much evidence against my client. I don't mind going to trial with these other three or four guys because I can sit there in the corner with my client and ask the cop or the witness what did you find? You didn't find anything against my client, did you? No, you didn't find anything against my client. No. And then he just looks like he's not really involved and you can keep kind of pointing the finger at these other ones. And and my client didn't really do anything, right? That maybe presentation wise, that looks good to be in trial with everyone else potentially. So it's ultimately a strategy question uh, for the attorneys involved on, on how do they want to pursue that. But you're right. It is the judge's decision is, do they go together? Do they go separate? Depending on what the attorneys are requesting, right? All of this information is so good. I really appreciate this. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we all have these questions. All right. So it, it seems that everyone is being held with a $1 million secured bond. Can you explain what that is? Sure. Yeah. That's uh, usually that's when you start getting in the millions, it's about as high as you go normally. Um, a secured bond means an individual can post that bond through a security. So they could go through a bail bonds company. They can go directly to the court, but a secured bond means an individual posts either cash or property with that amount of value. They post it up. They put it up. So for example, theory, I guess if someone had a million dollar home, 
and they have a million dollars in equity in that home, right? It's it's the equity that matters in that home, not just the home's worth a million, but they owe nine hundred thousand. It's only a hundred thousand equity in that home. That's that's not going to cover it, right? So that there's a security, there's something that the court is holding in their hands to assure this individual is going to show up in the future. If they don't, that that surety is lost, that home is lost, or whatever was put up is lost. But it does allow for the possibility of the individuals getting out if that amount is posted. The whole million? So I always thought you had to come up with like 10%. Right. Yeah. So it, there's two different ways to go about it. It gets a little bit confusing. Whether or not an individual goes through a bonds company or not, but a secured is usually, yes, 10%, wow. some security that covers you know something else, right? So so, so they have to come up with $100,000 Plus the million dollars of value somewhere. Is that what they have to do yes. to get out? Yeah. So there's a couple There's a couple different ways. It gets a little bit confusing, but they can go directly to the court and do it that way. If they find a bonds company that's willing to work with them, sometimes a bonds company will say, you just give us the, the 10%, for example, the 100,000, and we'll come up with the, the 900,000 wow. to cover the difference. But at the end of the case, you're not getting your 100000 back. It's not being returned to you. That's our cost of doing business, right? So it's a little bit on the business side of things when you're talking about a bond. The, the, the part that I think uh, the community should understand is there is the ability for these individuals to post, and there's the ability for these individuals to, to get out of custody. I've seen a million. I've seen more than a million. Um, but under the, the laws and the, the state of Arizona, Individuals are entitled to bonds. That is the law. They can't just... every single person, every single crime. They are. There's some rare circumstances where they're not entitled to a bond. If they're already out on a bond on a case and they commit a new offense, mm -hmm. then they don't get a bond on the new crime they've committed. So there are some circumstances where they may not be entitled to that bond. But generally speaking, the the law is and the presumption is you are entitled to a bond. Yes. Okay. And then I heard that the release conditions would be supervised release, ankle monitoring, no contact with your co-defendants, can't go to the scene of the crime. All those sound pretty familiar. If yeah. you're get what does supervised release mean? Yeah, supervised release means if they post that bond and they get out, they're under the supervision of pretrial services, which is kind of an arm of the probation department of the court. And so they would need to be checking in with an individual routinely. So supervisory release could entail things like a curfew. You have a curfew and you must be in at this time. It could be something as extreme as you got to put an ankle monitor on. Mm -hmm. um, it could be, yeah, like you said, you can't go around your code of finance. You can't talk to them. You need to check in with us. It could be you need to drug test. Mm -hmm. if we call you on this particular day. You better go drug test on that day. And if you don't come up as a clean test, your, your release could be revoked. So you're under supervision, not just out, you know, on your own. There's there's conditions that are put upon you, and those conditions can can vary uh, depending on, you know, the judge's discretion. So ankle monitoring doesn't mean you have to stay home. It, it means we know where you are, so you can go to work. Is that Correct. right? Okay. Correct. Ankle monitor doesn't mean you're stuck at home. It means you just have a monitor on, keep it charged, and we can look up your location at any time. And specifically here in, in Maricopa County, if you have an ankle monitor, you're restricted to Maricopa County. Generally speaking, in felony cases, you're restricted generally to the state of Arizona. So if you don't have an ankle monitor, you could go up to Sedona or Prescott or Flagstaff if you wanted to freely. But if you have an ankle monitor, you are kind of restricted to Maricopa County. Of course, attorneys, defense attorneys can petition the court to have that removed for special circumstances or for different things. I've had clients who you know, had a family member pass away out of state, can they have that removed to, to fly out of state on this day, return on this day, and and gotten permission from the court for certain circumstances, you can do that as well. How long do these cases usually take? Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I that that's the part. That's a great question. They are, it's going to be a long and a slow process. I mean, that's the thing that the community needs to know. That this is not swift justice in any way. I mean, it's if you think it took a long time to, to get to here, and I do, it takes even longer to, to get to the end of this. I mean, it, at usually on, on general felonies, when I say general, I'm not talking about murder cases. Mm -hmm. 
Um, usually at best it's, you know, six months, more like a year on the top end on these types of cases. Uh, I would say at best a year, it could be up to two, could be longer, just depends on what happens down the road, but it's going to be a long process because I am, uh, presuming based on experience, if it took the police and prosecutors this long to, to put it together and the evidence, and I imagine the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people they've interviewed and what they've gone through. It took them that long to to get to here to present to a grand jury. That's just them starting the case. Now, the defense attorney, whoever it is, who gets assigned or whoever they hire gets that evidence. It's going to take months and months and months to get that evidence in and months and months and months to review it and then formulate strategies and different things. So you're talking... Yeah, probably a few years before you see some type of resolution. Is, is it possible it could happen sooner? Absolutely. If an individual came in and met and felt it was in their best interest with their advice of their attorney to, to resolve their case early, if there was some type of offer being extended to them, they could resolve it much sooner if they chose to. Obviously, this is a very high profile case. Um, it's garnered a lot of media attention uh, with good reason. And so usually in my experience, those types of cases that are more high profile, that are in the news, they usually don't resolve quickly because there's a lot of pressure there, right? There's, let's be honest, let's call it what it is. There's a lot of political pressure here going on. There's political pressure for Queen Creek police. There's political pressure on Gilbert police. You know, why did this take so long? Why weren't you doing anything? Why didn't you respond to this stuff sooner? Could this have been prevented if police had done their job better, right? There's political pressure on on the county attorney's office as well. You know, you had opportunities earlier, you didn't, you waited, now you did this. You know, why? So there's political pressure. And when there's political pressure on politicians, right, they, there's going to be a certain response. So do I think it's likely they respond quickly or soon? Absolutely not. I think this is going to be a long, drawn-out fight. And I, I think because of the, the political... I guess, pressure or angles to this. I, I expect it to just be there for quite some time. Um, whether or not there's plea offers extended, I, I don't know. I don't know. I would assume not, considering the, the high-profile nature of what we're dealing with. I'm glad you mentioned that. I have a question that maybe I shouldn't ask, but I want to ask. Or People aren't going to like this question. <laughs> Do you think that this case has been overcharged based on the, is it a makeup call? Is it a ref who's missed too many things, who's doing a makeup call, or is this normal charging? Good question. I mean, I've seen it all. I've been doing that. I've been in criminal law for since 2005. It's It's been a long time. I've seen it all. I've charged these cases. I've defended these cases. So I've been on, on both sides of all levels of homicide cases and, and everything in between. So it's it doesn't get any more serious than this, right? Is... Um, I, I need to qualify this answer. I need to say first and foremost, like before I'm an attorney, I'm a, I'm a human being, right? Um, I'm an individual, I'm part of this community and my heart goes out to Preston's family and all those affected the victims of, of these particular crimes. I, I want to say that I, I know what I do for a living as a defense attorney and I defend people, but again, I, my heart goes out to that. I, I, but I've been doing this for a long time and Again, it doesn't get any higher than first degree. I, I believe if you ask Preston's family, his loved ones, those ones close, they would say, absolutely, this is the right charge. Mm -hmm. If you're asking, you know, people on the other side, is this the right charge? They would say, absolutely not. You know, maybe my loved one did do this, but this is just too much, right? Um, that is the decision on what to charge is, that's Miss Mitchell's decision, right? Um on what charge does she pursue? Um, and that's why she's elected to make those tough decisions. The voters have elected her to be the voice of the people on what is appropriate. Um, she feels like this is appropriate under these circumstances. Again, I'm not excusing one individual killing another individual by any way, shape, or form, but do I think first-degree murder is, is what... And that these people should be in prison the rest of their lives? Personally, I do not. What I'm really asking is, if there wasn't all this political pressure, is this the charge we would have seen under this set of facts? My opinion, no. 
based on your experience, based on your 20 years? No, no, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think it, I don't think it does. Um, I think this case has gotten a ton of attention because of where it happened, who it happened to, when it happened, and plus all the, the background of everything going on in, in Gilbert and what wasn't done and all the many other assaults that were going on. Yeah, this isn't the first time some crime like this has happened. An individual got beat and was beat brutally and, and died from it. Um, not that that was ever the person's intention, but this isn't the first time something like this has happened. And um, I think there is an aspect of pressure to this that to to go a little bit more. And my experience, again, I've been doing this a long time on both sides. I'm not just biased from this side. I've done it and seen it from both. When there's eyeballs on a case, things get, you know, more serious. Things get charged more. Everything is just looked at a little bit closer. And and I can't help but think because of all the pressure on this, you know, something has been ratcheted up. I'm not saying that they um, don't have the evidence to charge it. That's not what I'm saying, right? Prosecutors have discretion. The county attorney has discretion on what to charge based on evidence. And they can charge the most serious thing, the next most serious or this, wherever they want. And, and they have the power to decide that. And I, I think here they went, all the way to the top because of the eyeballs that are on this and, and what has gone on. I mean, I think when, you know, things were submitted to the county attorney originally a while ago and, and charges didn't go forward, there was kind of an outcry like, wait, what? It finally it finally got to you and, and you're not doing anything? That's crazy, right? That doesn't look good. No. Um, and I've known uh, Rachel for a long time. I, I worked there with her for many years. Uh, I'm not saying she's corrupt or anything like that. I, I think she does everything to the best of her ability. I really do. But I, I can't help but think there is some political pressure involved here. Absolutely. Do you think the adults who participated in the cover-ups will be accountable for Preston's case? Parents, coaches, staff, et cetera. Yeah, that, that's a great question. It's uh, it's pretty broad because you're getting into a lot of other aspects, right? I I'm, We're talking about the criminal law element, the crimes that are charged. Is there a liability for others that help cover up? Probably, but there's different types of liability. There's civil liability, right, where someone's being sued for money or damages and things like that on, on the cover-up. But does that rise to the level of of criminal? You know, I don't know because I don't, I don't know that, right? Uh, Again, I just forgot the name, but the woman who came out recently who um, works for, for Mr. Renner, right, and talked about right away they sent him up to Sholo, to the cab, and they, they got an attorney involved right away and whatever else. And again, I'm an attorney, and I put in my brain, look, hiring an attorney isn't a crime. Right. It's not. It's, it's not. As a public, do we love it that they went and hired an attorney and, and zipped it? No, we don't love that as the public, but we're in the United States and that's our constitutional right to do that is to get an attorney and, and be quiet. So that in and of itself doesn't mean the parents should be charged with something because they got their son an attorney. Absolutely, absolutely not. But was evidence destroyed? You know, those types of things are, are different questions that I don't have the answers to. But if there is evidence that mom, dad, or others destroyed evidence, destroyed cell phones, did this, did that. Yeah, that can be a criminal charge. Um, if an individual, again, I'm, I say this with all sensitivity, but if an individual is involved in a crime, presumably, they're not under a legal obligation to go turn themselves in. Hey, look at my knuckles. They're all bloody. Right. It's, it's like That's not what society and the law requires us to do. So him quote unquote, hiding out allegedly, I'll say, or whatever else, till his hands healed or whatever else. It's not a crime. It's, it's and, just... and it's not destroying evidence. Right. Letting your body heal isn't destroying evidence. Right. It, it's it's not. So, uh, you know, I need to parse that out when we're, you know, the question's a very broad question, so it's kind of hard to answer it totally for your for your viewers or listeners, but uh, I'm doing the best I can. But there, but there is the potentially, depending on what's there, yeah, others can can be charged or school administrators can be, you know, somehow 
have some type of responsibility to, you know, the community and others and different things, but that's more on the civil side of things versus the criminal side of things. The criminal is what's the crime? Did you help with the crime? Did you help get away from the crime, meaning drive away or hide evidence? But again, letting your hands heal, you know, staying inside and indoors isn't itself a crime, if that makes sense. Here's a really good question. With regards to Taylor Sherman, he's the one who allegedly recorded and is also being charged. This question is, does that mean anyone else with a video will be in the same position? Yeah, great Will question. someone who possesses a video, and I've got people DMing me about their kids having videos of different fights, and they're freaking out. Right, so right. Tell parents, what, what's the deal here? Yeah, no, I, I, that's what I was trying to hint at earlier, and maybe I wasn't very clear about it. You know, having videoed something that happened, some assault that happened, you're not, you're not a criminal for, for doing that. You're not. That's not a crime possessing a video of this kid beat up that kid or whatever else may have happened. That in and of itself, you're not in the same position as this individual that's charged. The fact that this individual is charged, I I have to believe, maybe I'll be proven wrong later, the, the prosecutor's got to have something else. Simply filming what's going on in and of itself is not enough. You're simply right. there and you're filming it. You're not doing anything. So if kids are out there and have videos of, of this or other things that doesn't make them a criminal. It might make them a witness. They might have evidence to something, but simply having it doesn't make them a, a criminal or put them on the same level. That's what I'm saying. There's, there's got to be something else for this particular, I say kid, individual involved. Everyone's a kid to me. Um, me so. <laughs> to, to this particular individual, there, there's got to be something else that led them to Put him on that same level with someone. Did he, was he part of this plan ahead of time? Well, this is what we're going to go do to this kid. I'm going to film it. You're going to hold it. Sure. You're going to beat him. Was there this plan? And he was part of that clear plan beforehand of it. And then it rises a level because now he is soliciting. He's aiding another. He's part of this plan or conspiracy to, to go do this thing, right? That's different than just you're there you're at a party or you're in the street or the party's being broken up and you're walking down and all of a sudden you you see a, a, a tussle going on and you you know you grab your phone and you pull it up and you start filming that that's a completely different scenario so parents don't worry if your kids have videos of things going on that teenagers do there is an email floating around from the Queen Creek Police Department to one of the alleged suspects who is thought to be the getaway driver Okay. And this email from Queen Creek Police Department that's floating around says, you know, we're not moving forward with you. You won't be charged. Um, this person also allegedly has ties to to police. Can you just address that? Because I know people are going to ask. That is shocking. I mean, it, that is. It's shocking. Look, I've been, again, I've been doing this a long time. I've seen all sorts of things. I, I have seen police do some odd things that don't make sense and seem contrary to things. An email um, to someone saying, hey, we're not going to charge you seems weird. I've never really heard that before. Have I heard of or seen or believe cops maybe on the side tell someone, hey, you, you tell me this and we'll let you go? Absolutely. I think that happens all the time. Is there official things where police say you cooperate with us and if you do so, we won't charge you? Yeah, we see those all the time. It's an agreement. They sign it. It's like a contract. And if you do this, right, you do this and and then we won't charge you. You help. We caught you with some drugs. You help us find some more drug dealers and we won't charge you with your possession of drug crimes or something. Those are agreements. Those are all formal things that are written out, signed. It's a, an official document. But an email is is odd for sure because it's just kind of a one-sided from and it's in in writing so it's not very subtle if it's in an email that's odd it's not well, like a signed contract says apparently were mom was saying hey when am i going to get my kid's phone back y'all told me you weren't moving forward and he wasn't involved and and apparently there's an email back that is you know been publicly posted saying yeah you're right what we know we're not moving forward with that we'll get you your phone back we'll let you know thanks for your patience just just bear with us Hmm. But so, yeah, how do, how do we odd. know? How do they? Yeah, that that is odd that they would say that. Um, but now we're 
we think that's the driver. Right. That's the allegation. Yeah. That is odd. I mean, if that's what's there, I will tell you the police saying, yeah, you're right. We're not doing anything. We'll get back to you in a minute. Can police change their mind? Absolutely. They can totally. change their mind, Right. The fact that if they haven't given the phone back yet, leads me to believe like, right. Like, oh shoot, we sent that out too soon. Maybe we yeah. shouldn't have. Always in the back of my mind, I've always thought from the beginning, Queen Creek is, by the way, like a newer police agency. Right. It's, it's not that old. It, I don't remember how long ago it was established. Very recently. So mm -hmm. talking about a new chief, a new chain of command, you're talking about new people at Queen Creek Police Department. That wasn't around, you know, 10 years ago. This is- Right. It's Creek two years old. Right. Yeah. I was going to say, I can I was going to say two, but I wasn't mm -hmm. sure. It's, that's, that's baby. It's infancy. It's brand new. So- I I chuckle internally when I see these things and I'm like, oh, they're new. They're they got one of the biggest, most serious cases right off the bat and they're learning the hard way of what to do and what not to do, obviously. And that's probably a clear example of what not to do is tell someone you're right, we're not doing anything with your kid when you know it's again too early to say that. Too early to say that. They can yeah. change their mind. And and that's the thing that people need to understand as well. The county attorney, when they got those alleged uh not alleged when they got the reports from police before to charge them and they didn't the county attorney doesn't say back to them we looked at this and we're never charging these people they don't that's not what they say they may have said and i believe they probably said to them hey look can you get us more evidence can you get us more information we need this or we need that or can you get this cell phone or get into that cell phone or go interview this person or that person get us do some more investigation and then bring it back to us they would never give a hard no Right. Because you you don't know, especially in a case like this, who else and what else is going to come forward. So why would you ever talk in absolutes of you're right. We're not doing anything with your kid. We'll give it right back. Like it just doesn't make sense that they would do that other than I would chalk that up to lack of experience or yeah. you know, proper yeah. conduct. So but they can absolutely change their mind if evidence comes to light later. This actually might be the driver. Oh, shoot. Let's hang on to this phone. There might be something actually in here. Let's actually hang on to this phone. Let's look at cell phone tower data. Was it in the area? Was it driving out of the area at the specific time? And there's all sorts of stuff they can get off of a phone. Mm -hmm. It's like pictures and videos, right? Mm -hmm. um, do the victims get a say in the charges? No. Good question. Victims don't get a say in the charges. However, under Arizona law, under the Arizona Constitution specifically, there's a victim's bill of rights. And so victims don't have a, a right to say what the charge is. But now that there is charges, I understand there's there was arrest warrants that were made, right? And so once the case gets started in the court system, victims will have rights to attend court, to speak, to address the court uh, whenever they want and talk to the court. They have the right to talk to the prosecutor and consult with the prosecutor about what they think, what they want, what they believe, plead this out, don't plead this out, don't give them a plea or give them this plea or I'm okay with this, I'm not okay with that. They're allowed to give their input now that the case is in the court system as an alleged victim. That's part of the, the victim's bill of rights under the Arizona Constitution. So they don't get to say what the charges are, but um, they do get to participate absolutely in the process via the prosecutor's office and, and directly to the court now moving forward. Mark, that is all the questions that we have. If you don't get conflicted out, <laughs> I am positive that we will have more questions for you. I for sure. really, really appreciate you coming on and educating us and an answering all of my questions. Really appreciate yeah. it. Absolutely. It was great to participate with you and just let me know if you need any help in the future. Thank you. I will. And it's great to meet you. Thanks so much for listening to the Modern Divorce Podcast. Remember, anything you've heard today or anything you read online is not the replacement for actual consultation with an attorney and does not create an attorney-client relationship. Even if you called in and we spoke to you, you were anonymous and we don't have your details and you have not become a client of Modern Law. However, we would love to speak with you or you should seek out the advice of legal counsel or counseling or any other expert near you. And if you have an idea for a show topic or you need to speak with an attorney in Arizona, you can reach me at info, I-N-F-O, at mymodernlaw.com.